This is the story of one of the most tragic incidents in aviation history, of how a jumbo jet goes berserk, plunging up and down at 7,300 meters, of how an innocent mistake made years earlier puts over 500 lives at risk, and how investigators literally stumble on the reason behind the biggest single air crash in history. Japan Airlines Flight 123 is uncontrollable. Next. the last video ever taken of Japan Airlines Flight 123. It's late summer and millions are traveling home for a traditional Japanese holiday. Something exploded. Japan Air 123 request. The plane is only 12 minutes into its flight when terror strikes. It's out of control, plunging up and down hundreds of meters at a time. And it's headed straight into the mountains that surround Mount Fuji, the tallest mountain in Japan. On the ground, Japan Airlines staff search frantically for the cause of the problem. In Tokyo, air traffic controllers try to guide the plane to safety, while the pilots resort to desperate measures to keep the plane aloft. Tokyo, Japan, August the 12th, 1985. In most of Japan, it's the eve of Obon, when people traditionally honor their ancestors, often returning to their place of birth for family reunions. Tokyo's Haneda Airport is crowded, with thousands trying to get home. On the tarmac, jumbo jets are lining up. Air travel is so popular here that Japan Airlines has to use 747s even for its short internal flights. Tokyo Area Control handles all aircraft over central Japan, including those on their way to and from the city's two big airports, Haneda and Narita. It's six o'clock in the evening, but the rush won't be over for hours. Crowded passenger lists and busy controllers make it a typical holiday weekend. Roger, approved as you request. Cathay 456, turn right on heading 250, climb and maintain flight level 240. At Haneda Airport, Japan Airlines Flight 123 is boarding. Among the passengers is young Yumi Ochiai. She's actually a flight attendant for Japan Airlines, but today she's off duty. Yumi takes a seat, four rows from the back of the plane. At 6.12 in the evening, flight 123 takes off heading for the industrial city of Osaka, 400 kilometers to the west. It's filled almost to capacity, 509 passengers and a crew of 15. Japan Air 123, contact Tokyo departure. Roger, Japan Air 123, Air 123. Captain Masami Takahama is 49 years old and one of the airline's senior training captains. On this flight, he'll be handling the radio and keeping an eye on the first officer who's sitting in the captain's seat. Yutaka Sasaki is flying the plane. He's hoping for promotion to captain. Hiroshi Fukuda, a veteran flight engineer, is the third man on the flight deck. Tokyo departure, Japan Air 123. Passing 8, uh, 800. JAL 123's route will take it south over Enshu Bay then southwest along the coast, until finally taking a sharp right turn to land in Osaka. The flight will take 54 minutes. 
Flight 123 is leaving Tokyo behind, climbing to 7,300 meters. 12 minutes into this short flight, the plane's black box shows that all is going well. Hello, pet. What's the problem? Someone wants to go to the restroom. Shall I let him? The plane's black box records a routine request from a passenger. He wants to use the bathroom before the seatbelt light is turned off. Be careful, please. An ordinary request on a routine day. Air is rushing out of the cabin. The oxygen masks drop down automatically when the air pressure falls. The explosion, the sudden loss of pressure in the cabin. There must be a hole in the aircraft. Gear door. Check gear. Gear. What? Check gear. Gear. The pilot's first thought is that the landing gear doors have blown off. Squawk 77. 7700 is the emergency code. When the crew radios this code to the ground, air traffic control will know the plane is in trouble. Every plane on the controller's screen carries a label, giving the plane's identity. Suddenly, the label beneath Flight 123 changes. Someone in the cockpit has keyed in the emergency signal. The plane's crew members are baffled. They know only that there's been a loud noise, some sort of explosion, a subsequent drop in cabin pressure, and a growing loss of control. Yet their instruments offer no clues to the mystery. Engines. Oh, engines okay. Ominously, right the pilots can't get the plane to respond. It's dropping! Right turn. Right turn. Hydraulic pressure. It's dropping! The plane's flight controls are powered by hydraulic pressure. The elevator, which makes the plane go up and down, the rudder, and ailerons, which make it turn. On a big modern jet, all these are too heavy to operate with cables and levers. Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. Instead, they're controlled by hydraulic fluid, which flows in pipes around the aircraft. It's the lifeblood of the plane. Tokyo, Japan Air, one, two, three, request immediate trouble. Request return back to Haneda. Move up. Roger, approved as you request. Turn right to heading 090. Put the mask on secure. Put the bend around your head like this. Don't bang so much. Yes. Crew members, please help out with the oxygen bottles. Repair the oxygen bottles, please. Don't bang so much. Turn it back. It won't go back. Nothing seems to be working. All the controls are dead. They're 7,300 meters up in the air, traveling at nearly 540 kilometers an hour and unable to control the plane. In the growing uncertainty of the situation, the pilots know they need to get down fast. The controller is puzzled. Instead of making the anticipated 180 degree turn back to the airport, the plane now veers off its course, but not towards Haneda. No. No, uh, 123, negative, negative, negative. Please confirm that you are declared emergency, that's right? That's affirmative. Request the nature of your emergency. Hydraulic pressure all lost. All lost? No, look. All lost? Yes. The company, please, make a request to the company, please. Do you want to make a fuss? The crew seem paralyzed and don't radio the airline or answer the tower. The officials on the ground don't know that the plane has lost its hydraulic power, but their screens tell them it's flying erratically and is Let's possibly descend. out of control. Right turn, descend. Look at his altitude. Up and down, up and down. But now, on control. Put your heart into it or it'll stop. The hydraulics failure has caused a serious problem. For the last few minutes, the plane has begun flying in an alarming pattern. 
First, it climbs steeply, then tips over and goes into a terrifying dive of 1,200 meters, only to level off and begin to climb again. This repeats itself over and over again. The pilots cannot understand this bizarre behavior, and they are powerless to stop it. Tokyo Area Control, August the 12th, 1985. The controller receives an emergency signal from a jumbo jet that left Haneda Airport 13 minutes ago. Tokyo, Japan Air 123, request immediate. Trouble. Request return back to Haneda. Mover. What the oxygen must In the cabin, confusion and panic spread like wildfire. There's been an explosion, and now some passengers are gasping for air. Hydraulic pressure is dropped! The plane's precious hydraulic fluid is gone. That's why the flight controls aren't working properly. Don't bang so much. Turn it back. It won't go back. Airline personnel are trained to take charge in a crisis, and passenger Yumi Ochiai helps out even though off duty. At Tokyo Control, the controller is now joined by his supervisor. Who's that? JAL 123, he's declared an emergency. He says it's uncontrollable. He says he wants to go back to Haneda, but his heading is all wrong. He can't seem to turn. Get him to Nagoya. That'll be the easiest. It's a straight line. The best solution would be for the plane to switch course to Nagoya Airport, which is 128 kilometers straight ahead. But they'd need to start descending immediately if they're going to land there. Right, your position 72, 72 miles to Nagoya. Can you run that Nagoya? Negative. Request back to Haneda. It's a longer runway. The captain wants to try to get back to Haneda. It's a large airport and ideally suited for a jumbo 747 in an emergency. But it's in the opposite direction. If he can get it down. Uh, 123, can you descend? Roger, but the descend. black box shows that he doesn't descend. Without control of the aircraft, they can't. In the thin atmosphere at this altitude, the passengers are finding it difficult to breathe. People without oxygen masks may soon become unconscious. The situation worsens as some of the masks at the back of the plane run out of oxygen. It's been five minutes since the explosion, and a flight attendant is finally able to call the cockpit with news about what's happened to the plane. Yes, what is it? The flight attendant tells the engineer that the explosion has occurred in the rear of the plane and may have come from the baggage compartment. So, Listen, right now the baggage compartment right at the back has collapsed. Uh, I think we'd better descend. They need to get down quickly before the passengers become unconscious. But the captain seems to be struck by a strange paralysis. All the passengers are using the mask. Shall we descend a little? The captain does not reply. It's possible that by now he and his crew are suffering from hypoxia or lack of oxygen to the brain. Uh, the R5 pet? At this altitude, the oxygen in their blood starts to fall. First, their judgment may become impaired. Eventually, they may lose consciousness. The R5 pet? Yes, I understand. Captain, the R5 mass have stopped! At the R5 door, the situation is becoming critical. The oxygen supply has failed. The cabin crew have to give the passengers whiffs of oxygen from a gas bottle. Still, the captain and his crew seem to be drowning in confusion. I think we better make an emergency descent. Yes. Now, shall we use our mask too? We better. I think we better use the oxygen mask. Yes. But they don't put on their masks. No one knows why. It might be indecision or hypoxia beginning to cloud their judgment. A 
at Japan Airlines in Tokyo, flight operations have been alerted to the emergency, but are as mystified as everyone else on the ground. All they know is that over 500 lives are at stake. It's their job to try to diagnose the problem and come up with a solution while the plane is in the air. This is Japan Air Tokyo. Tokyo Control said they received an emergency call from you. And listen, right now the R5 door has broken. Uh, Roger, is the captain returning to Tokyo? What? Can you return to Haneda? Uh, uh, just a moment. Uh, we are making an emergency descent. Uh, we'll contact you again in a little while. Uh, keep monitoring us, please. Uh, Roger. R5 door. Could it have come off? If the door has come off, that could mean an explosive decompression of the cabin as the air rushes out. Passengers may have been sucked out kilometers above the ground. But there's a worse possibility. If the door hit the tail of the aircraft, it could have damaged it. The tail keeps the plane stable. Its rudder and elevators make the plane go up and down or side to side. If the tail is damaged, flight operations will be powerless to assist them. In Tokyo, news that a Japan Airlines jumbo jet is in trouble has leaked almost immediately. Japanese television is already breaking into regular programming with live interviews. Someone saw the crippled jet fly overhead. I knew the plane was in trouble, he is saying. It was swaying back and forth. Then it disappeared in a cloud. Flight 123's meandering route has put it in range of an American Air Force base at Yokota on the northern outskirts of Tokyo. An American controller there has overheard the conversations between the plane and Tokyo Air Traffic Control. He wants to help to offer Yokota runway for landing. Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, Yokota approach. If you hear me, contact Yokota. Pilots are preoccupied and don't respond. Since they've lost all normal control of the plane, they're now testing the throttles to see what happens. They can make the plane go faster or slower. At least they have speed at their command. As they experiment, they find that if they push the throttles forward when the plane is diving, making the engines go faster, it actually makes the plane come out of the dive and brings the nose up. And if they pull back the throttles when it's climbing, slowing the engines, the nose tips and begins to dive. These actions are the opposite of what a pilot would normally do, but it seems to work, and they begin to flatten out the mad roller coaster ride. Then a second experiment. By applying more thrust to the engines on the left side of the aircraft, they manage to slowly turn the plane right in the general direction of Tokyo. Then their luck runs out. In the frantic juggling of throttles, the pilots get out of step. It drives the 747 into a frenzy. Both hands. How about gear down? Gear down! So put the gear down. Lowering the landing gear should slow the plane down and make it more stable. Uh, doesn't work. Should I lower the alternate? For safety, 747s employ an electrically run system, separate from the hydraulics, that can lower the landing gear in an emergency. While the engines are turning, they still have electric power. Lowering the landing gear helps stabilize the plane. The drag of the undercarriage has a dampening effect on the pitching motion. But it also destroys the directional control they were getting by applying more power to one side of the aircraft. Max power. Close to Mount Fuji, the tallest mountain in Japan, the plane makes an abrupt turn to the right and begins a terrifying dive. The plane is falling at 900 meters a minute, twice the normal rate of descent. We're going down. Heavy. Hit me. Put the wheel on the way. On the way. It's on the way. Heavy. Hit the gear down. Here's There's no need for us now. The plane's black box records the flight attendant still trying to calm the passengers. Japan Air, one, two, three, uncontrollable. He's gonna hit the mountain. Tokyo control, Tokyo control, this ADS, sir. This is 
All station, all station except the Japan Air 123. Keep silent until further advised. Uncontrollable. Understood. Do you wish to contact? Stay with us, please. Stay with us. Just as suddenly the plane comes out of its dive, they've dropped over 3,000 meters. They're now in amongst towering mountains, but at least there's more oxygen at this altitude. The pilots have been fighting the plane for an intense 22 minutes since the explosion. This may be hopeless. The hydraulic fluid is all gone. It's uncontrollable. Terrain. Hey, mountain, come! The rain, the yes. rain, 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 rain! Good the mountain, back far. Applying maximum power in order to lift the nose is their only option. In their efforts to control the plane, they've allowed the speed to drop too much. To escape the mountain, they need maximum power to generate more speed and more lift. Stick with it. Stick with it. It's first on the way! Uh, uh, the other uh, Go lower the nose! Uh, it's lowering! We're going down! Uh, the passengers grasp the seriousness of the situation. Many of them prepare for the end. But increasing power to avoid the mountains has caused the plane to resume its wayward up and down motions. Having run out of options, the crew is forced to repeat the same futile procedures over and over. They've been fighting the plane for nearly 30 minutes now. Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, Yokota. The air traffic controllers, Japanese and American, are desperate to help, to give Flight 123 any information or reassurance they can. Request a radar vector to Haneda. Roger, understood. Keep heading 090. But frustratingly, the plane continues heading off to the northwest, away from both Haneda Airport and Yokota Air Base. Now, with every rise and fall of the plane, they're barely above the mountaintops. Can you control the aircraft now? An ominous silence descends on area control. Japan Air 123, switch your radio frequency to 119.7. 119.7, please. They try changing radio frequency. If you can, change the frequency to 119.7. There is no reply. If you read, come up on 119.7, we are all ready. Your position, five, uh, four or five miles northwest of Haneda. In the tensions of the moment, the controller is a bit confused and mistakes the plane's distance from Haneda. Northwest of Haneda? How many miles? Yes, that is correct. On our radar, you're 55, five, five miles northwest. We are ready for your approach at any time. Yokota is also available for landing. Let us know your intentions. Over. At Haneda Airport, emergency services are being mobilized for the plane, wherever it can touch down. Yes, Roger. Oh, ah. They say we're 25 miles west of Kumagaya. Suddenly, the plane goes into a steep dive, the worst yet. Stop the flap. Ah. Power! Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! Power! The plane is falling at 5,500 meters a minute.
Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123. Can you hear me? Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123. Do you read? Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123 is gone. At Tokyo Control, they've lost contact with a Japan Airlines jumbo jet full of passengers. An American plane flying in the area has been listening in to the drama of Flight 123 and reports seeing flames in the mountains some hundred kilometers west of Tokyo. One of the C-130 pilots later said that they even guided a rescue helicopter to the scene and American Marines stood by, ready to rappel down to the burning wreckage. But before they could do so, they were ordered to return to base. Rivalry between the various Japanese emergency forces is reported to have caused confusion and delays as the victims of the crash wait for help. During the night, the Japanese self-defense force arrives on the scene. A helicopter flown by Captain Isuzu Omori finds the crash site. The pilot radios in. Minoka Yama, Victor 107. I see something. I see flames in about 10 spots over an area of about 300 meters square. Victor 107, Minoka Yama, is there any sign of survivors? Victor 107, no signs of survivors. Visibility poor, too much smoke. Victor 107, can you land to investigate? Not a chance. It's a 45 degree slope down there. No more to put down. And there's fire everywhere. Seeing no sign of survivors and unwilling to risk a landing at night, Captain Omori returns to base. Meanwhile, a team of rescuers is on its way by road. But since they don't expect to find anyone alive, they spend the night in a village 68 kilometers from the crash site. At the crash site, the passengers of Flight 123 lie dying. The next morning, the last moments of Flight 123 start to become clear. The 747 sliced a path through the trees near the top of Mount Osutaka, one of the mountains north of Mount Fuji. The plane finally hit a ridge several hundred meters further on and exploded. The wreckage and passengers then tumbled down the steep side of the mountain. It's now 14 hours after the crash, and the Japanese Self-Defense Force rescue team arrives at the scene. They are confronted with the worst single aircraft accident in history. find a survivor. It's the off-duty flight attendant, Yumi Ochiai, still hanging on to life. And she is not the only one. Rescuers find a 12-year-old girl wedged in the branches of a tree and airlift her to safety. Incredibly, two more passengers are alive, a young mother and her eight-year-old daughter. It's nothing short of a miracle. 
but how have these four survived? The human body is believed to be able to stand a forward deceleration of up to 25 times the force of gravity. But investigators report that from the speed at which the aircraft hit the ground, those at the front of the plane experienced a sudden stop of over 100 Gs. The four survivors are hurried to a hospital in Fujioka City. Investigators will soon discover that all four of the surviving passengers were seated in the last seven rows. This is how they survived. In the back of the 747, the impact forces were much less. Sheer luck had protected them from the flying debris. Yumi Ochiai has a broken pelvis and a fractured arm. She tells a disturbing story of what happened as she lay on the mountain, awaiting rescue, and that many more passengers survived the crash. After the crash, I heard harsh panting and gasping noises from many people. I heard it coming from everywhere, all around me. There was a boy crying, mother. I clearly heard a young woman saying, come quickly. Suddenly, I had a boy's voice. OK, I'll hang on, he said. It sounded like the voice of a boy of about school age. In the darkness, I could hear the sound of a helicopter. I couldn't see any light, but I could hear the sound, and it was quite near, too. We'll be saved, I thought, and waved frantically. But the helicopter went further away. Don't go, I waved desperately. Help, but it faded. I could no longer hear the voices of the boy or the young woman. It's clear now that many died in the cold night air, waiting for rescue. The crash of this jumbo jet would normally be a strictly Japanese affair, but it sets aviation alarm bells ringing around the world. Only weeks earlier, an Air India 747 had gone down in the Atlantic, killing 329 people. Now another 520 dead. Was there something wrong with the 747, the world's biggest jet? Could there be some unknown design fault? There were some 600 747s flying worldwide. A problem with the plane would have grave consequences for aviation. Ron Schleed, a top investigator with America's National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, was assigned the case. So it was very big concern on our part uh, about whether there was a problem with the 747, an airworthiness problem. And so we had to jump on this uh, very quickly to learn what happened. At the Washington headquarters of the NTSB, the chairman was extremely concerned of the potential consequences for world aviation. He wrote a personal note to his opposite number in Japan, begging him to invite the NTSB to join the investigation as guests. During the late 70s and 80s, Ron Schleed was involved with many of the major foreign investigations for the NTSB. He's familiar with the sensitivities of working with foreign governments and heads to Tokyo, where he'll meet the rest of his team, representatives from Boeing, the plane's manufacturer, and an engineer from America's Federal Aviation Administration. When I arrived in Tokyo, the atmosphere in Japan was uh, extremely stressful. The news media were everywhere. There was a tremendous amount of anger. Once in Japan, Schleed found that the local Japanese police had taken over the investigation and were treating it like a crime scene, diligently observing his team's every move. Everyone was, was considered suspicious. Japanese airline personnel, Boeing personnel, were considered suspicious. They weren't even allowed to go to the accident site. Schleed had to wait for two days before the Japanese authorities would allow him to visit the site. I was able to convince the Japanese to allow us to take Boeing people to the site with the stipulation that the Boeing people stick, stuck very close to us and uh, we supervised them while they were on scene. They could not operate on their own. 
fleet found that to gain access to the site, the Japanese had quickly constructed helicopter landing pads. It was an amazing sight to look up at this mountain and see what looked like wreckage from an airplane at a distance, but you could not recognize any part of an airplane. There were scores of helicopters in the air landing and taking off every couple minutes. Amidst the wreckage of JAL-123, Schleed found that some families of the victims had managed to scramble to the remote mountain site on foot and build shrines to their loved ones. From above, flowers rained down on the investigators. I recall these big white, I believe they were Chinook helicopters, flying over, and uh, there were families aboard the helicopters looking at the accident site. They were quite high, and they were dropping flower, flower petals down onto the accident site. The one thing that we found uh, when we got to the accident site was that many of the passengers had a lot of time to think about the end. And uh, they found many, many notes written on pieces of paper, anything they could get their hands on. My darling wife, life with you has been wonderful. Our children have grown up to be people I am proud of. I never dreamed that the dinner we had last night would be our last together. Passengers were able to think and realize that they were out of control and maybe gonna crash, so they wrote notes to their loved ones and left them in the back of the seats or in their pockets. But what could have caused this disaster? Neither the heart-rending letters nor the tangled wreckage yet yield any answer to what happened to Flight 123. Still, the main thing the investigators have to go on are the words on the plane's cockpit voice recorder, those of the plane's flight engineer who had said that door R5 was broken. They believe that the door has somehow come off in flight, crashed into the tail, and damaged the plane's flying surfaces. The horizontal stabilizer, which makes the plane go up and down, the rudder, which controls side-to-side -side movement. But then, a piece of news that destroys that theory totally. The door had not come off. It's found by the investigators amidst the wreckage. The flight engineer was wrong. Ah, uh, right now the R5 door has broken. The warning light on his panel led him to believe that the door had failed in flight. But the alarm may well have been set off by a short circuit in the electrical system, caused by the ceiling collapsing in the explosion. It was not a broken door that caused Flight 123 to crash. The investigators would have to look elsewhere. Stop the flap! Power! 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 Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! It's up! Japan Airlines Flight 123 has crashed into Mount Osutaka, taking hundreds of lives. Investigators are worried about a hidden fault in the Boeing 747. They need to find the cause of this crash quickly. A photograph taken by an amateur photographer provides the first clue to the mystery of why the plane became unflyable. There's something odd about the image. Photographic technicians put it on a computer and work hard to enhance the photograph to sharpen up its blurred lines. Finally, they get a clear enough picture. The whole huge tail fin of the airplane is missing. It's what keeps the plane steady. Since most of the plane's hydraulic fluid lines pass through the fin, it starts to make sense why they lost hydraulic pressure and control of the plane. Then, 
A Japanese Navy ship steaming across the bay south of Tokyo came upon the plane's tail fin floating on the sea. It's at the very spot where the plane had first reported an emergency. Investigators are now certain that the starting point of the accident must have something to do with the tail of the aircraft. They review the known facts. Something had caused the ceiling at the back of the plane to collapse. There had been an explosive decompression of the aircraft. Whatever it was also ripped off the tail fin and the main hydraulic lines with it, making the plane uncontrollable. This may be hopeless. The hydraulic fluid is all gone. I lost. Explosion, decompression, loss of the tail fin and hydraulic failure. The investigators need to find out what links these four elements together. Routinely, the investigators begin by looking back into the plane's history. And they make an intriguing discovery. The plane had been in another accident seven years earlier. The pilot landed the plane with its nose too high. The tail struck the ground and scraped along the runway. There had been a repair to the rear part of the airplane, including the rear pressure bulkhead. All modern jets, uh, aircraft, when they climb, they have to be pressurized to keep the cabin to a reasonable level for the passengers. So let's take a 747. When the 747 is on the ground, it's actually somewhat oval-shaped. And as it climbs and pressurizes, it becomes more circular. The rear pressure bulkhead is like a huge metal umbrella lying on its side at the very back of the plane. Its purpose is to stop pressurized air escaping from the cabin out through the tail of the aircraft. It must be very, very heavy and strong because the forces are tremendous. They're over eight uh, PSI differential, very a lot of pressure. The design of a 747 aft pressure bulkhead was what they call a dome. And uh, it was uh, uh, designed to take the pressure with a lot less heavy metal. And it's a, it's a typical design. It's a pressure dome. Seven years earlier, Japan Airlines called in Boeing to repair the cracked bulkhead. Boeing engineers spliced a new panel into the damaged bulkhead. But at the accident site of Flight 123 in 1985, Ron Schleed stumbled across a piece of wreckage that unraveled the whole mystery. It was a piece of this new panel that had been spliced into the bulkhead. The repair had, in fact, not been done correctly. There was only one row of rivets holding that joint together, uh, where there should have been uh, two rows of rivets holding the joint together. To explain to the Japanese investigators what he discovered, Ron Schleed sketched out how the repair should have been made and the mistake that had been made. It was a catastrophic error. The rivets were carrying twice the force they should have been. One of the FA engineers there did some calculations for us based on this earlier repair of the bulkhead. And his theory was if the repair wasn't done correctly, for example, if they had not put the rivets in properly and they only had one row of rivets holding the bulkhead together versus two as designed, that it possibly could, it would fail prematurely. The FAA engineer calculated that the faulty repair to the bulkhead would fail after 10,000 flights. From the moment the repair was done, it was simply a matter of time. The investigators found that a simple human error had led to this. On a summer's evening in 1985, Japan Air 123 lifts off from Haneda Airport. It's the 12,319th takeoff since the repair of the damaged bulkhead a repair that the investigators calculated would only hold for 10,000 flights. 
As the plane climbs to 7,300 meters, the air outside gets thinner and thinner. But the air inside the cabin is pressurized for the passenger's comfort. The difference of pressure between the passenger cabin on one side of the bulkhead and the unpressurized tail on the other stretches the bulkhead and its faulty repair to the breaking point. In a test which duplicated these conditions, cracks began to appear and lengthen around the rivet holes until the bulkhead snaps. In an instant, pressurized air from the cabin blows a hole in it two to three meters square, bringing down the ceiling around the rear toilets. The highly pressurized air blasts its way into the tail fin of the aircraft and simply blows it off. From that moment on, the plane is doomed. The pilots don't know, and will never know, that most of the tail of their aircraft is missing, blown off into the sea below along with the crucial hydraulic lines that allow them to control the plane. It all finally makes sense. Without the stabilizing influence of the tail, and with the loss of ability to control the rudder and flaps, the pilots cannot control the plane. The giant aircraft now oscillates in a terrifying motion called the fugoid cycle. As the nose drops into a shallow dive, the plane gathers speed, which generates lift. The nose rises again, and the plane begins to climb until it loses speed, tips over, and begins to fall again. The whole cycle repeats itself over and over again. Flight 123 is now plunging up and down in terrifying dives sometimes several hundred meters at a time. It really could be considered a miracle that the pilots were able to keep the airplane flying for 30 minutes or more after having lost all the hydraulics in their flight controls. But it kept circling and eventually worked its way into the mountains, and it became impossible for them to, uh, to land. There was no real alternative for them at all, uh, except to fly as long as they could and hope for some miracle, which never occurred. Lower the nose. Lower the nose. Yes. Both hands. How about gear down? Gear down! Put the gear down! To understand what the pilots were up against, four hand-picked flight crews were placed in a simulator and confronted with the same situation. Not one of them could land the plane. The pilots of Flight 123 managed to keep their plane in the air for 30 minutes, much of it among high mountains, an amazing feat of flying. Back in Tokyo, as the cause of the JAL accident was identified, Ron Schlied had to break the news to his colleague from Boeing, one of the top designers of the 747. The simple truth was that a single row of rivets had been used when a double row was required. And when we uh, described our findings to him, you can imagine this Boeing man became very, very upset, uh, uh, personally uh, was crying because of the fact that his airplane that he designed and then the people that did the repair, because it was Boeing people that designed and did the repair, had made an improper repair that caused the airplane to crash. The Japanese police wanted to bring criminal charges against Boeing for its part in the tragedy, but the prosecutors decided not to go ahead. Boeing's reputation was damaged, but if they could derive any comfort at all from this tragedy, it was that there was no inherent fault in the 747. The plane continues on to become one of the most successful civil aircraft of all time. However, Japan Airlines, the innocent party, had no such comfort. After I left uh, the scene and came home, it was my understanding that one of the senior Japanese Airlines uh, uh, maintenance managers actually committed suicide. The Japanese Airlines president resigned. The bookings slumped. Rumors abounded in Japan that the airline was indeed guilty and that Boeing was just taking the rap for a valuable customer. It's taken years for Japan Airlines to recover from this experience, the worst single plane crash in history. Here up, please. A routine trip from Memphis, Tennessee to San Jose, California. 
Little do the crew know they will soon have to defend themselves against a determined attack intended to kill them all. Flight 705 will never reach its destination. We've had an attempt to take over. Investigators will uncover a meticulous plan and a desperate motive. It's April 1994. A FedEx cargo plane is on its way to California. Ah, it's a ah. perfect day for flying. Altimeters, nines and twos here. But behind the cockpit, in the galley area, a disaster is about to unfold. The pilots of FedEx Flight 705 are seconds away from an unprecedented situation. Oh, <laughs> April the 7th, 1994. Worldwide headquarters of Federal Express in Memphis, Tennessee. Servicing 171 countries, the company delivers over 2 million packages per day and works to a tight schedule. Flying conditions are perfect at the Memphis airport. FedEx Flight 705 to San Jose, California is preparing to depart with a three-man crew. Has the afternoon flight to San Jose got any jump seaters on it? None at all? 42-year-old Auburn Calloway is a flight engineer. He hopes to hitch a ride on Flight 705 for pressing personal reasons. Thanks. Employees have the privilege of free rides. They're known as jump seaters. 39-year-old flight engineer Andy Peterson is the first of the flight crew to arrive on the plane. Andy Peterson, Auburn Calloway. He's surprised to find Auburn Calloway on board. My first thought was, well, scheduling has gotten, uh, it's also called someone else out for the flight, and now we've got two engineers, so I said hey to him and then asked him if he was uh, going to be riding out to San Jose with us, and he said he was, that he was going to ride the jump seat out. Peterson, a five-year flyer with FedEx, finds something unusual during his pre-flight check. The breaker switch of the cockpit voice recorder, or CVR, is in the off position. Puzzled, Peterson resets it. The CVR records all in-flight voice communications. It's a crucial tool for investigating air disasters. No large commercial airliner is allowed to fly without one. The cockpit voice circuit breaker, it had popped out which meaning the power's off to the cockpit voice recorder. Uh, so I'd never seen that before, and I thought, well, that's kind of weird. 49-year-old pilot David Sanders and 42-year-old co-pilot James Tucker are next to board and prepare for departure. Mind if I hop around with you guys California? No, not at all. I don't see any problems today. Everything looks good. You, uh, you play the guitar? I play at it. He was very cool, uh, calm, collected, uh, nothing indicating anything was amiss. Actually noticing there was a guitar case off to the right in front of the 9G net. Yeah, but I couldn't wait to get in the cockpit and start going through cockpit checks because we had a lot to do. But something was amiss. They didn't know it, but Callaway had originally been scheduled to be the flight engineer on this flight. However, he and his crew had exceeded their flying hours by just one minute the previous day, so they'd been replaced but Callaway was determined to make Flight 705 no matter what. I think she'll fly. Oh, got some bolts around? Yeah. Uh, when I came back out on the airplane and went back up to the cockpit, I noticed that that circuit breaker had popped out again. So I reset it and decided that I would see if it would stay in. 
uh, instead of calling maintenance at that time that I'd just wait and see if it, if it popped back out that I would call maintenance because that is a no-go item. If the CVR is turned off, there will be no audio record of the events aboard Flight 705. You want to fly this leg of the trip or do you prefer the return trip? You never know when you're going to get another chance. <laughs> I met Jim Tucker that afternoon. Jim had been with the company for 10 years. In fact, he was an instructor in the DC-10. Andy Peterson and I had had a trip together. In fact, we flew to Paris one time. The crew is flying together for the first time. Both Tucker and Sanders are ex-Navy. Sanders has been with FedEx for 20 years. James Tucker, who has a wife and three children at home, has been with the company for 10 years. None of the crew know Callaway or his reasons for being on this flight. Express 705, heavy runway 27, clear for takeoff. Express 705, cleared for takeoff. Lights if you want them. <laughs> I mean, clocks if you want them. Lights are coming on. We'll get the vertical speed wheel here in a minute. How's the checklist look? All right, before takeoff is complete. Your airplane? Set standard power, please, before they change their mind. Power is set. Flight 705 is airborne and westward bound. The weather to California is clear, and if all goes as planned, they'll be back home within 10 hours. But back in the cargo area, Auburn Calloway is launching a different plan, a plan he's been shaping and reshaping for several days. Like the brilliant chess player he is, Calloway has thought out all his moves. Being bounced from the crew of Flight 705 today was an unexpected glitch, but nothing he can't cope with. At his home that morning, Callaway already had to make a small adjustment to his plans. The flight bag he'd planned to take with him on his journey is in for repairs, so instead he packs a guitar case as a company employee, he's unlikely to be searched, and a guitar case seems innocent enough. Here you have a man who made some accomplishments that no other African American had ever made. Callaway graduated from Stanford University in 1974. He became a top Navy flyer, then a commercial pilot, but his five years at FedEx have been as a flight engineer. He was highly intelligent, a driven person uh, to accomplish goals, and uh, had before him a, an opportunity of a, a tremendously positive uh, career. He was married and had uh, children and family, and it just seemed as though um, he was almost uh, part of the uh, true American dream, just about, the American family. Before leaving for the airport, Calloway put some important documents on his bed. Among them, his last will and testament. FedEx Flight 705 is several minutes outside Memphis, still climbing and passing through 5,800 meters. Jim Tucker is hand-flying the airplane using control wheel steering mode and enjoying the clear afternoon skies. A couple of meters away sits Auburn Calloway. Behind him lie frustrated expectations of a brilliant career and a marriage that ended in tears. Two minutes, nines and twos here. After takeoff is complete. Calloway has a terrifying plan. His guitar case is packed with several hammers and a spear gun. Out of sight of the crew, he gets his weapons ready. To be successful, Callaway will have to act quickly. Speed and strength will be critical.
Callaway is a former Navy pilot and a martial arts expert, so speed and strength come as part of the package. The uh, original plan was to uh, take out his original crew, which would have only been two individuals. One was a female, much smaller than the crew that he wound up facing on Flight 705. No, I live in Fisherville. Fisherville, great spot. I had the cockpit door locked open, and I noticed that Callaway was walking up into the cockpit. I just caught him out of the corner of my eye and basically saw his uh, you know, his arm coming up, and I thought, well, he's just coming up to sit and talk with us for a while. Excruciating pain, blinding pain. So much, in fact, that uh, I never lost consciousness, but I lost useful consciousness for at least 45 seconds. A blow to the head will rattle the brain. It will shake it enough that it, the electrical connections momentarily are not working. And it can be anywhere from a complete irretrievable loss of consciousness to simply a stun uh, uh, or to what he describes as, as a period of time where he was somewhat aware of what was going on but, but could not respond to it. I was slumped back like this. And he looked, I remember, right in my eyes as he passed over. It was almost probably like, well, the lights are on, but there's nobody home here. Well, this guy is out of action, so I'll move on to the next person. The crew is in shock and confused. What I saw was simply a face in his eyes and an object coming down at me. I didn't discern any emotion or hate or anger. I just saw a threat, and I didn't really know what the threat was, because it's so shocking. And for a crew member who is a pilot in uniform to attack another pilot is unheard of in the airline industry. Although terribly injured, Peterson and Tucker are still alive. Oh, get him! Get him, buddy! Get him! Callaway hurriedly retreats out of the cockpit. Unaware of each other's injuries, the crew starts to mobilize. Callaway has a backup plan. The spear gun stashed outside the cockpit is a deadly weapon. Sit down! Sit down! Get back to your seats! This is a real gun, and I'll kill you! There was a loud ringing in my ear, and I was a little unbalanced. But I saw this spear gun, and I thought, well, the only thing I can do is try to grab it. So I grabbed the spear. It sticks out of the spear gun about, I don't know, four inches or so. So I grabbed it right behind the barbs and tried to hang on to it real tight. Tucker does something that Callaway is not expecting. He pulls back the yoke and puts the plane into a sudden 15 degree climb. It throws the struggling men out of the cockpit into the galley behind. I had already figured out that what I had in my hands is probably one of the best weapons available, and that was the aircraft itself. Tucker has not been just a Navy pilot, but a combat instructor flying A-4s. His fighter pilot experience would prove invaluable in the next few minutes. I was looking at this whole situation as if it was an air combat maneuvering situation. Get him! We're taught in the Navy and uh, in, in the fighter community as the, you know, the first thing you want to do is, is engage the bogey and engage the bad guy. You make him predictable by engaging him, uh, and, and, and you use his predictability then uh, against him, and then you kill the bogey. Get him, get him, get him! But the co-pilot doesn't stop there. Tucker immediately rolls the massive aircraft to the left in an acrobatic maneuver to try and disarm Callaway. The men roll along the smoke curtain to the left side of the plane. I knew that I had to do something very abrupt, uh, very, very rough, and something that he would not be expecting. Tucker has no idea whether rolling the plane is helping Sanders and Peterson as they try to restrain Callaway. The fight continues with the men pinned to the left side of the plane. The crew members are rapidly losing blood and strength. 
Tucker continues to execute the role, all the while trying to maintain a visual reference outside the captain's window. Get him, get him, Andy, I got the airplane. Yeah, so you roll the airplane over on its back and pull through completely in the vertical. But at this particular point, uh, you know, if, if I'd rolled the airplane over on its back, I wouldn't really be able to see what I was doing. This is not a bubble canopy that you have over the top. You're actually looking out. It's got expansive windows, but nonetheless, you roll this airplane over on its back, uh, you can't really see that much of what you're doing. So I rolled it to about 140 degrees where I could still see out over the side as the airplane's nose was starting to come through. Tucker rolls the quarter million kilogram DC-10 to 140 degrees, almost on its back. Commercial aircraft are never meant to roll more than 60 degrees. The men continue their fight on the ceiling of the aircraft. Calloway wrenches the hammer in his hand free and hits Sanders in the head. Tucker decides to pull back on the yoke and put the plane into a steep dive, a risky but cunning move. The g-force of the dive pushes the men back along the ceiling to the smoke curtain. The plane is traveling at a very dangerous speed. Tucker is making demands of the aircraft for which it was not designed. DC-10s are never meant to be flown past 695 kilometers per hour. Tucker is over 800 kilometers per hour. No DC-10 in history has been flown so fast and survived. The airspeed indicator was maxed. It was all the way to what we call the barber pole. Couldn't go any faster, but you could tell that you were going very, uh, quite a bit faster because the things you don't normally hear in a jet that size, and one is the incredible amounts of uh, sound of wind coming across the cockpit. The plane approaches supersonic speed. With the increased airspeed, the airflow over the stabilizer becomes disrupted. The elevators begin to flutter back and forth. If the flutter becomes more pronounced, they may become inoperable, and Tucker will no longer have the means to pull the plane out of the dive. If I didn't pull out soon, the airplane was probably going to come apart because I was getting into a, a, a phenomenon known as mock tuck, where the airplane is pitching over because the airspeed is increasing so much, the uh, the, uh, the the wind flow over the over the the, the surfaces of the wings is is doing things that it's not even designed to do. The injury to the left side of Tucker's brain is beginning to paralyze functions on the right side of his body. Tucker notices something alarming. The plane is traveling at this incredible speed because the throttle levers have been left in their automatic climb setting from takeoff. The DC-10 is now in a vertical dive with the engines at nearly full power. Tucker must release his only usable hand from the yoke to pull back on the throttles. With power reduced to idle, the DC-10 is still not out of danger. Despite Tucker's maneuvers, Callaway is gaining the upper hand. Callaway hit me with the third blow, which was in the top of my head, nearly rendered me unconscious. I began to gray out. At that very same time, it occurred to me we might lose this thing. As Tucker starts to pull the plane carefully out of the dive, the elevator flutter increases. Balance panels, counterweights that help the pilots manipulate the elevator, break free and begin to wrinkle the skin of the stabilizer. Tucker fears that if he pulls back too hard during the dive, all the surfaces on the tail section would be in danger of coming off. Sanders' strength is nearly spent, and Peterson's head is bleeding profusely from his ruptured temporal artery. Somehow, they manage to pin their attacker down. The G-forces begin to be reduced as he began to level off from pulling out of the dive. I saw the hammer in Calloway's hand. I then reached for the hammer with both my hands and pulled the hammer out of his hand. Sanders believes this is a turning point. The plane is safe for the moment.
About a minute after the attack begins, Tucker finally has a chance to radio Memphis. Centers! Center emergency! Air traffic controller Kent Fleshman Aircraft and his trainee receive Tucker's emergency request. Aircraft with emergency, say again. Center. Aircraft with emergency, say again. Listen to me. It's Express 705. I've been wounded. We've had an attempt to take over and abort the airplane. Give me a vector, please. Back to Memphis at this time. Hurry. Express 705, fly heading 09 or 5, direct Memphis. 095. Direct to Memphis. Get me an ambulance and alert the airport facility. Hey, Memphis, you still with me? Affirmative 705, descend and maintain 10,000. Fleshman takes action in case the hijacker has a gun. If he can get the plane below 3,000 meters, a bullet hole in the fuselage will not cause explosive decompression. Tucker hears the fight increase in the galley. Again, he uses his only weapon, the aircraft. The maneuver throws the men onto the side of the plane. Let go of this fear. Look, just keep talking to me, OK? Express 705, affirmative. If you need an ambulance, stand by and we'll get that for you. Yeah, we need an ambulance and... Uh... We need armed intervention as well. Make sure and notify the SWAT team he's asking for armed intervention. Fleshman recognizes the term armed intervention as the most serious request from a pilot. It means they want armed officials to storm the plane upon landing. Memphis' approach has to be alerted. We have an emergency, Express 705. He's had an attempted at takeover on the aircraft. He's had an attempted at takeover? OK. Radar contact, put him on 119.1. Paul Candelino, a 44-year-old veteran controller, now spots Flight 705 on his radar screen. But something's wrong. The plane is heading away from the airport. It looks like the hijacker has seized the plane. The crew of FedEx Flight 705 has been attacked by a co-worker and have declared an emergency. Air traffic control watches helplessly as they fly away from the airport while the fight for control of the plane continues. Co-pilot James Tucker is pushing the DC-10, his best weapon, to its limits. He now throws the wheel round, flipping the massive plane in the opposite direction. Tucker, drawing on his military experience, reverses the role, keeping his maneuvers unpredictable. Here I am, all alone in the cockpit. The fight is still going on in the back. I don't know who's winning, I don't know who's losing. And that was about the only time I really had time uh, to be frightened, and it was a very horrifying situation at that point, uh, thinking that quite possibly uh, Auburn was winning. Three and a half minutes after the attack, Though pinned and injured, Auburn Calloway will not relinquish the spear. The anger was coming in then, and so when I hit him, it was with the intent to disable him and eliminate his ability to fight. Not kill, but to injure him sufficiently that he could fight no more. So when I swung the hammer, it was with all the strength that I had. Sanders and Peterson momentarily subdue Callaway. We're going on it, pilot. We get back here. The captain's yelling at Tucker to come and help, but he's the one flying the plane. I've contact Memphis approach on 119.1. They are aware of your emergency. Jim. Quick, Jim. Request a single frequency approach. A single frequency approach. Roger, we'll pass that along. 119.1. Put it on autopilot. Come on, Jim. Quick. Get back here. But you have to understand that that's probably the, the strangest request that I've ever had you know, come my way because here I am, uh, the only one up front in the cockpit now, for, and for me to go ahead and get up and go to the back means I've got to, uh, first of all, stand up, which I didn't know until the particular time I tried to stand up. It was very, very difficult to do so. Jim Tucker, with a fractured skull and only one side of his body functioning, puts the plane on autopilot and struggles out of his seat to help. Hey, wait a minute, I'm coming. 
but the plane's gyros haven't stabilized sufficiently for the autopilot to take over. Okay. Yeah. Now, no one's flying the plane. 705 Heavy, how do you hear? Paul Candelino tries to establish radio contact with Flight 705, but there's no response. Their radar screens show the aircraft turn to the north, then the west, finally southwest, heading away from the airport. There's only an eerie silence. Anything could be happening on board the plane. As I stepped into the forward cargo area, uh, I was absolutely amazed at what I was seeing. All three of the individuals are completely covered with blood. Auburn Callaway on his back. There are papers everywhere in the back. You can see where the jump seats, uh, which is just a normal uh, commercial airline seat, has had the covers torn off. There's bloody footprints on the top of the ceiling. There are coats that have come out of closets. Um, it, it's total carnage in the back. Sanders has disarmed Callaway and handed the spear to Tucker. You move up to it. You keep him contained. I'm going to get the airplane. Go get the airplane. They decide that Sanders, the captain, should fly the plane back to Memphis. You take this. Tucker wants the weapons as far away from Callaway as possible and asks Sanders to take them with him to the cockpit. In an emergency situation, it's expected that the captain of the airplane will fly the airplane. I was in somewhat of a daze because of the fight. I wasn't sure of the direction of the airplane. I wasn't sure of the condition of the airplane, but it appeared to be flying OK. I was bleeding excessively from, uh, from the top of my head. It couldn't see out of my left eye. I thought the fight was over. I mean, I had hit Callaway four times in the head with a 20 ounce framing hammer as hard as I could swing it. He had stopped fighting and he was bleeding, and he looked like he was severely injured. Tucker can't tell anymore whether his hand is gripping the spear. The blows to his head have caused a blood clot on his brain and have damaged his sense of touch. Let me up! Let me up! I won't fight anymore! Please, I can't breathe! Though several gashes have been opened in his skull, Auburn Calloway cannot be trusted. Both pilots know their strength is quickly running out. Sanders, safely back in the driver's seat, must get the plane on the ground and fast. Memphis, can you hear me? Is this Express 705 Heavy? 705 Heavy, yes. Express 705 Heavy, Memphis. Roger, I do hear you. You can proceed direct to Memphis if able. Expect runway niner. The altimeter is 30.29. You understand we're declaring an emergency. We need security to meet the airplane. We'll stop on the runway if we can. Captain Sanders, without his glasses and with blood dripping into his eyes, thinks that the plane is on a course back to the airport. But it's still heading southwest, away from Memphis at over 550 kilometers per hour. Roger. Express 705 Heavy, is the situation under control? Or is it still in progress? We appear to have it under control. Candelino wants to warn the pilot, but he's afraid the crew may still be under attack and trying to mislead the hijackers by flying in the wrong direction. Express 705 Heavy, are you able to turn toward the airport? Uh, yeah, give me a vector. 100 zero, zero, Vector Memphis. Sanders takes the plane off autopilot and sets a course back to the airport. We're turning to the airport now. For now, aboard the DC-10, the situation seems under control, but a potential disaster is only moments away. At the Memphis airport, emergency personnel begin to move into position. We need security to meet the airplane. We'll stop on the runway if we can. A FedEx cargo plane is about to land after a would-be hijacker tried to seize control. All members of the crew are badly injured. Paramedic David Teague is one of the first to get the call. They came over the uh, loudspeaker system from the uh, air traffic control center, and uh, I was new to the area, uh, so I wasn't able to understand them real well, but I got the words hijacking and some other stuff and, and was advised that there had been a hijacking on, a, on an airplane, and then dispatched us out to the runway where the plane was going to be landed. 
The airplane is heading for the safety of Memphis Airport, but that in itself presents another scary possibility. The aircraft is more than 16,000 kilos over the recommended landing weight, with more than 38,000 kilos of fuel still in its tanks. In most emergency landing situations, there's time and opportunity to dump any excess fuel. But Sanders knows the switches and levers are too far away to access safely. You'd have to get up and go back to the engineer's panel where the uh, fuel dumping switches are and set up the engineer's fuel panel to dump fuel. So it's virtually impossible for, say, the captain uh, to dump fuel while he's attempting to fly the airplane. In the galley, Auburn Calloway still hasn't given up the fight. Calloway drags himself towards the jump seats with Peterson and Tucker on top of him. He hopes to gain enough leverage to get back on his feet, where he'll have an advantage. He was using his thumbs to go ahead and try and push my eyes out, doing everything he possibly could to break Andy and I down as a team. You know, we could handle them together, but we certainly couldn't handle it one-on-one. -on -one. This is certainly a, a, a fight against the clock. Uh, Auburn's getting stronger. Uh, I know we're getting weaker. I knew if he ever got back in the cockpit, we were history. I just knew we had to keep him. Somehow, we had to keep him from getting back in that cockpit. Approaching 7,000 feet, the fight in the back started again. And it was as violent and as loud as when I was in the back in the midst of the fight. It became so violent and loud that approaching 7,000 feet, I decided that I was going to level the airplane, turn on the autopilot, go to the back of the airplane, and kill Callaway. It was so severe, I thought that had to be done. The DC-10 is less than 40 kilometers from Memphis Airport. Is he under control? I don't know. The sound of the struggle worries Sanders. He decides this has to end. I released the seatbelt, climbed out of my seat, headed to the back of the airplane, and Jim Tucker said to me, David, I think we have him under control now. I said, are you sure? Yeah, he is. He said, I think we have him under control. I went back to the seat, climbed into the left seat of the airplane, continued to descent on down toward the airport. Express 705, have you verified the situation is still under control? Uh, yeah, we're uh, it's, uh, sort of under control. The wind is uh, 03015, clear to land runway niner. <laughs> Clear to land. Now Sanders faces yet another possible disaster. The delay caused by getting out of his seat means he's way over the normal approach speed, too high and too fast. He'll not be able to slow the overweight plane quickly enough to land on runway Niner. Coming around to three six left. Runway three six left is longer at 2,800 meters but it's perpendicular to his flight path. To land there, he needs to make a series of turns, reasonable maneuvers for a fighter jet or a crop duster, but for an overloaded DC-10 with an injured pilot, nearly impossible. First, he must turn 90 degrees to the right, fly parallel to the runway, and then execute a tight 180 degree turn. Okay, Express 705 Heavy, runway 36 left, cleared to land, cleared visual approach, 36 left, wind is uh, 050 at 8. Bank angle. Sanders must ignore the computer warnings and push the plane beyond normal operating limits. The plane is nearly on its side. All of a sudden, he just turned it up on his wingtip, looked like a fighter jet, and uh, put it in a real tight turn and then disappeared down behind the terminal when he got down low enough, we couldn't see him. And uh, uh, at first, well, I thought he might have crashed because there was some construction going on on the, run, on the airport at that time, and there was some smoke coming up south of the terminal, kind of where we were going. A hammer is lying in the galley. The men struggle to reach it. This could be Callaway's last chance to gain control. Sanders has turned 90 degrees to the south, flying the downwind leg parallel to runway 36 left. The airplane was probably at about 300 feet above the ground at that time. 
the throttles are at idle. They've been at idle since I left 7,000 feet. That's an extremely unusual engine power setting to land a big airplane. You always land, make the approach with power on, a lot of power on. In this case, it was at idle because I wanted the airplane to slow down so that we'd not exceed the limits of the landing gear and the flaps so that we would touch down at or below 195 knots. With flaps extended and landing gear down, Sanders is still coming in too fast, and he's being bombarded by computerized auto-warning alarms. The runway is 2,800 meters long. A normal DC-10 needs only 1,900 meters to stop. But Flight 705 is too heavy. Even this runway may not be long enough. Peterson manages for the first time in the fight to get hold of a hammer, but is extremely weak due to blood loss. You gotta hit him, Andy, you gotta hit him! I was almost like pleading with him, and I told him, I said, Andy, you know, you gotta hit him. You know, he's, he's about ready, you know, to take us down. And I guess I gave him kind of a blank stare of, you know, what are you talking about? And he looked at me real stern like a father would look at his son, saying, you've got to do this. And he said, Hit him. The DC-10 is only meters above the runway, traveling at 382 kilometers per hour. Sanders can only hope he won't explode the tires or crash beyond the runway. Luckily, all 10 tires withstand the landing impact. Captain David Sanders has landed the plane with only 300 meters of runway to spare. The crew of Flight 705 is safely on the ground, but not out of danger. Blow the door. The chute is covered with kind of a talcum powder, so it won't stick when it needs to be deployed, and, but it made it slick trying to go up. The police and firemen tried to climb up the slide. One fireman made it almost all the way to the top, and I leaned out with the door of the airplane and pulled him on board. Who's the bad guy? That's the attacker. There was blood all over the floor, all over the ceiling. Uh, the seats in the in the little area uh, were, were just covered with blood. You got any handcuffs? Huh? If not, you better get some, because that son of a bitch is still dangerous. I need handcuffs. Can you throw me some handcuffs? Teague is thrown a pair of handcuffs. Stand here, in the middle of the chain. <laughs> Get your foot off! You're hurting me! Ow! Sanders holds Callaway down as Teague examines Peterson, who barely has a pulse and is the first crew member to leave the plane. Sanders is the last member of the crew on board. Standing in the door of the airplane, I had a sense of euphoria I've never experienced before since. It was the sense of we had been there, and uh, and we came back and we won. Due to the strength and courage of its crew, a FedEx DC-10 has safely landed back home. The three men have weathered the attack of a co-worker, but they're badly injured. <laughs> Co-pilot Jim Tucker has bone chips driven into his brain. Flight engineer Andy Peterson's life is in danger from massive blood loss. Both are in critical condition. The wounded men are rushed to the regional medical center at Memphis. The pilot, Dave Sanders, shares an ambulance with Tucker. It's only during this ride that he realizes the extent and severity of his co-pilot's injuries. Tucker is taken to emergency by stretcher. 
Sanders is helped, but can walk. Restrained and under guard, Calloway is also taken to the same emergency facility. But the important question still remains, why did Auburn Calloway attack the crew of Flight 705? The full story is beginning to unfold. Divorced in 1990, Auburn Calloway still tries to support his ex-wife and their two children, and wants to secure their financial future. He was very interested in the welfare of his children, very interested that they not live the kind of childhood he had lived. The evidence for a suicidal mission against FedEx grows as investigators search the aircraft and find a letter to Calloway's estranged wife. Dear Pat, I want you and the kids to know that I lived for you. I thought of your welfare every day. Though, for example, how can I guarantee having enough money for Keela and Bernie Stanford education? He was obsessed with his financial well-being. He was interested in his children. Um, I tend to believe he's interested in his marriage. And I know his marriage was coming apart, or had come apart, basically, at the time of this incident. Um, but I suspect he was also a difficult man to be married to. By April the 7th, 1994, Calloway may be thinking his career is over. Life had been one disappointment after another. The failed marriage, the kids he can't afford to send to university, the brilliant pilot who ends up as an engineer on a cargo plane. And now even that may be about to go. The following day, he's supposed to report to a FedEx hearing about falsified information he'd given the company. During our investigation, it appeared that he had overestimated the number of hours of flight experience that he had uh, and uh, that the uh, company was taking a look at this. Callaway may be afraid he'll be fired. At just 42, his professional life could be finished. He comes up with a solution. The goal is to leave my children well off. The goal is to escape, I guess, the pain of this life. Uh, I can't continue to participate in this life and still leave them well off because I'm fixing to lose my career. And I won't have the ability to provide for them like I'd like to. But my life has value if it's given in an accident. Callaway cashes in all the funds he can lay his hands on and sends a total of $54,000 to his ex-wife. But his life insurance is worth about two and a half million dollars if he dies in a work-related accident. I would much rather go on a date, time, place, and a method of my own choosing. I resolved some time ago that the next time my security and future is threatened or seriously jeopardized, it's time my time to go. Perhaps he believes his family would receive the maximum insurance payout if he crashed the plane in an apparent accident. If this was Calloway's idea, he was planning it perfectly. He was armed with unusual weapons for hijacking, hammers and a spear gun. After injuring the crew, he could take control of the plane. A bomb or gun could leave traces at the scene of a crash, but if investigators found a spear gun or hammers, it would be very difficult to tie them to an attack on the crew. I believe it would have been impossible to tell the difference in the type of injuries that a hammer would have made uh, with the type of injuries that you might sustain in a, in a large crash. Uh, Auburn had spent the week leading up to this uh, incident preparing to, uh, to die and basically get his affairs in order. Callaway even goes to a lawyer to change his will before boarding the FedEx flight. He left his will and testament on his bed so that uh, it would be easily found. For any crash to look like an accident, there is a key obstacle the plane's cockpit voice recorder. Switching off the CVR's power would disable any recording. I think she'll fly. As long as all the nuts and bolts are there. Yeah. If Peterson, in his pre-flight inspection, discovers the thrown switch, it would be a setback. But Callaway would know he simply has to fly the airplane for half an hour. 
that's the length of the tape's recording time. After 30 minutes, any incriminating recording would be gone forever. I think he was going to do something very, very horrible with it. Something along the lines of what we've seen on 9-11. Had Calloway been able to seize control of the plane, he could have crashed the DC-10 with over 38,000 kilos of fuel aboard into any site, including the FedEx headquarters, the hub, crippling his employer and killing a large number of workers on the ground. It would have been the ultimate revenge for perceived injustices by the company. The company may never have figured out exactly why that airplane crashed back into the hub. Well, after 9-11, there were a lot of uh, improvements to our security program, both in the United States and worldwide. Uh, our cockpit crew members are the most highly checked and monitored group of people in the world. I only know of this one incident uh, in my 46 years of aviation experience where a crew member was involved in something like this. The flight of FedEx 705 took about 30 minutes, but the impact it had will last for years. He was convicted of attempt aircraft piracy, an offense that carried a minimum of 20 years confinement and up to life in prison. Although Auburn Calloway pleaded temporary insanity at his trial, the jury didn't believe him and found him guilty. On August the 11th, 1995, he was sentenced to life imprisonment in a federal penitentiary. He has no chance of parole. The pilots on Flight 705, they are the real heroes. It is amazing that they were able to do what they did, given the injuries that were inflicted upon them. When someone's struck with a hammer on the skull, there can be linear uh, radiating uh, cracks that go out on the skull. And then if it's hard enough, there may well be an uh, indriven bone right at the site where the hammer head hits the skull and drives it into the skull. This is a replica of my skull cap. Um, it's, uh, it was uh, put together by, by use of a, a CAT scan protocol uh, to give the, uh, the proper uh, you know, shape of my skull and also the, the shape of the defect that we're dealing with here. This is the area that I was hit on the left parietal. For a year and a half, I was actually walking around in this configuration. It took two and a half years to recover completely because I had to learn how to walk, talk, and chew gum all over again. I had three major operations. Uh, I operated on him uh, twice more after his initial uh, injury and then followed him through his rehabilitation. They can fashion a piece of material to fit the exact size of the defect, uh, the shape of the skull, and of course the thickness of the skull as well. It's a blown acrylic called an HTR or hard tissue replacement. He had difficulty with speech, difficulty with, with sensation and motor strength on the right side. And he uh, came back to where he can now uh, probably, if he wanted to, break my fingers with a handshake. On May the 26th, 1994, the crew of FedEx Flight 705 was awarded the Airline Pilots Association Gold Medal Award for Heroism, the highest award a civilian pilot can receive. However, because of the legacy of their injuries, none of the crew has been certified as medically fit to fly commercially. I always thought, I'm gonna fight, I'm gonna, I'm gonna overcome this thing. Except that that's when they found out that I had a uh, slight seizure disorder. I'm seizure free, but it's because I had to take medication. And the only way for me to, to be able to fly uh, uh, without somebody with me is to be off of medication at this particular point. It's been, it's been uh, ascertained that I'll never be able to do that. I'll be on medication for the rest of my life. Uh, I miss the flying. Every time I see an airplane go over, I, you know, I wonder where it's going. So I miss that part of it. Uh, but I really cherish the fact that you know, I'm still alive and able to be with my family. Uh, the bond of pilots and what you do together in the airplane, outside the airplane, all that, I miss that. I miss it very much.